So I would also like to introduce you to today's presenters, Ann Rollins and Myra Roldan. Ann Rollins, a senior instructional strategist for GP Strategies Learning Solutions Group. She has over 20 years of experience developing learning for global companies. She designs and develops instructor-led, virtual, web-based, and blended learning solutions. She also leads and conducts global learning needs assessments and learning strategy development for her clients. She enjoys educating others on the value of including micro and social learning, subject matter expert enablement, and mobile learning components as part of our clients' learning ecosystems. Myra is a dynamic and creative senior instructional designer with over 15 years of experience creating innovative training solutions for adult learners in corporate environments. She joined GP Strategies about five years ago and has worked with several clients, including Fortune 500 companies. What makes Myra stand out is that she knows how to go with the flow and is able to build strong relationships with her clients, allowing her to quickly assess their needs and analyze requirements to recommend training solutions to help her clients perform like rock stars. And I'd also like to add one additional note. They weren't expecting this, but I want to do a little shout out to Myra and Ann. They recently won um, Best Sales Training Solution at Demo Fest during the Learning Solutions National, uh, National Conference recently. And uh, their, their solution incorporated augmented reality as the centerpiece of uh, the learner experience. And so kudos to you guys for winning that award. Um, and without further ado, Myra, I will let you go ahead and uh, kick off the session. Thanks, Kayla. So let me just share my screen really quick. Okay, so thanks, Coach, for that great introduction. Um, but before we get started, I just want to take a quick moment and set the tone for what we will be sharing today. So this webinar is going to be a little bit different, as Kayla mentioned. Um, Kayla's going to be interviewing Ann and I, asking questions that we get most of the time when it comes to this particular VR project. And as all, we all know, um, and, you know, if you're familiar with virtual reality, VR, it's a fully immersive technology that requires um, the use of specialized equipment to engage with the environment. Uh, so think Tron, right? And today, many organizations are looking for ways to incorporate virtual reality into their environment. But the development can be costly, time-consuming, and it does, rec it does require specialized skills and software to develop. So um, here we have the basic flow for the webinar on screen. One thing we will not be doing is that we will not be discussing how to program a virtual reality solution. That's a totally different webinar and impossible to cover the time we have today. So are you guys ready to get started? Are you ready, Kayla? I'm ready. I have all the questions in my hand, so then I guess, are you ready? I'm ready. All right. We're ready. Let's, let's, let's kick this thing off. So um, I've known you both for a while, and you I know you've worked on uh, several, quite a few, a variety of high-profile projects. How has this one particular project presented to you? Sure. Um, Great. Hey, everyone. This is Ann, and uh, that is Tom Heiser on the left of the screen there. He's our Director of Learning Technology. He's also going to be joining us a little later in the call for our Q&A session. Um, so in late July, he approached me with a unique project. Um, the request was to create a virtual reality solution that would allow senior learning leaders from all across the customer base of GP Strategies to have a meaningful learning experience I'm using virtual reality as the delivery mechanism. Um, I knew it was going to require a lot of creativity um, that's really different from kind of your typical traditional instructional design project. And I immediately knew that I wanted Myra on the team to help with the solution. Um, <clears throat> and so the requirements that we were given included basically have something ready and functional in eight weeks. This was from the inception all the way through delivery, it included the instructional design elements, um, the learner experience design, building out the graphics concept and the graphic um, artifacts, um, the mobile app development, um, on-screen and other instructional content for the piece, the actual virtual reality environment development, and then functional testing and deployment. So as you can imagine, um, eight weeks was a, a very short time to be able to move this through. Yeah. Kayla, what do you have next? Yeah, that's a, that definitely sounds like a tall order. Um, so did either of you actually have any experience designing a virtual reality game or activity? 
So, Kayla, that would be a big fat no. Um, so, VR is emerging technology. So, we didn't even have uh, a network in the uh, L&D space that we could reach out to for guidance. But what we lacked in VR experience, we made up for an award-winning knowledge of um, designing a learner experience. Um, and also, given the short development time and the fact that we were working on this pet project on our spare time was also um, kind of a challenge for us because we were also supporting our client work at the same time. So we didn't have 100% focus on this particular project. Um, so we knew from the start that this project would need us as learning practitioners along with the developers to value each other's strengths in order to deliver what we set out to create. So we needed a strong team right out the gate. So what's your next question, Kayla? Um, well, going back to experience, and I'm still kind of stuck on the fact that you guys, you guys didn't have any prior experience to that. So how did you decide to actually take this on and tackle the virtual reality project? Okay, so I'm going to switch gears here really quick. Um, so Ann and I have collaborated on a variety of projects in the past, and we've always used what we call the almighty Google Docs. Um, and as you know, if you've used Google Docs, you know that it allows you to work simultaneously on the same document and see what the other person is typing real time. For Ann and I, that has been our magic tool. Um, so we're going to be showing live notes as we continue forward so you can see our process. So do you want to start, Anne? Yeah, sounds good. Um, so as soon as, as soon as Myra and I were officially on the project team, we started brainstorming, as Myra mentioned, um, using Google Docs. Uh, we knew that we had some basic technical and resource parameters, um, which I shared earlier, but we also developed some of our own additional requirements. So for this activity, um, and I see best question, why did the customer ask for VR? This was a GP internal um, inception project. And so it was almost like a, what we call kind of an innovation kitchen, um, where we can put um, some of our talent at some of the emerging technology and stand up a project pretty quickly. For this one, it was for our customer forum event, which is held every year. Um, and we were celebrating GP Strategy's 50th anniversary. Uh, we knew that we needed topics and metaphors that were significant to senior level people. As you can see on the screen, this is um, one of the emails that kind of kicked off the project with all of us together. Uh, you know, but in terms of putting a metaphor around this activity that was going to be significant, remember we've got senior learning leaders from a huge number of our clients coming from different industries, different walks of life, different experiences. Um, oh, we, we knew that we needed to get them up um, and engaged from the very minute that we started the activity. And that's where we get into some of the real, one of the real considerations with virtual reality is if you're implementing it as part of a group activity, how do you build something that is meaningful for everyone involved? Um, obviously having every single person in a large group in a virtual environment could be a tough thing to manage. Myra, do you mind showing our first spec that we put together? Definitely. And that one's the one dated, yeah, state 719 there. Great. Okay. So, yeah, um, definitely. So for this spec, we started with a really broad, high-level conceptual design focused on game mechanics and the activity flow. Um, and we really knew that we needed to start sharing our design specs with the tech team, like, from the moment that we started. Um, so they could start to get their arms around what we envisioned the end product to be, because none of us had really developed a VR solution before. Um, and what we did is, so let me just scroll down here. I'm going to show you an email that we actually shared. We wanted to um, really give them some examples that they can pull from. So we wanted to share some games that would provide inspiration for, for what we were setting out to design. Um, so Ann and I, we looked at several games, we played a lot of games, and we ultimately agreed that we had two games that we wanted to share with the team that were suitable for what we were trying to do. So the first game is a non-VR game, and it's this one uh, right here. It's called Escape the Room, um, and if you've never played it, I, I encourage you to play it. It's a fun game. And then we also shared a VR game 
uh, called Lost in Kismet. And you'll know that it's a VR game because it has the same panel duplicated because there's one for the left eye, one for the right eye. And you can actually play this game without the Google Cardboards or without a cardboard or VR glass. Anne's going to drop the links to these games in the chat window so you can explore these after our session. Um, they're available freely in the App Store, so they're free of charge. So, Kayla, what's your next question? Yeah, and actually, Kayla, real quick, I'm not able to drop those into the chat pane, so we might be able to open up after we get started on the, your next question so that I can get those dropped in for folks. Okay, sounds good. I'll make sure to open that up for you. Um, so the next question I wanted to ask is once you have the design planned out, and thank you for going through the details of that, did you guys actually create the um, actual VR elements as well? So that's a great question, Kayla, and the short answer is no. However, we did realize that we would have to iterate the game to account for, you know, tech requirements and the platform that would be used to develop the actual game. We also needed to share some visuals uh, with the team because we wanted to make sure that we could provide some kind of guidance for the developers when they were creating the environment. You know, so as they were working along, they would have something that they can reference. Um, and do you want to um, show our brainstorming document that we actually worked on? Yep, yep that sounds good. Um, so, so we really kicked this thing off on that first email was, was dated on, um, on the 18th or 19th of July. So the first real brainstorm where we started, uh, really the second iteration, um, is reflected here. So in this game, or in this vision, it involves five different levels that were represented by different virtual rooms. Um, each room successfully completed unlocks the next round and room for successive players. So for instance, taking 40 people, eight teams of five, each person would have their own room and their own virtual experience, okay? So as each room is unlocked by different players on the team, the vision was that the Google Cardboard then gets passed from player to player. Um, and as we flushed out the details, one of the things that we discovered is that this created a far more complex solution that would be a stretch for our eight-week timeline. So let's take a closer look um, to the doc here. So we've got a pretty complex game involving five rounds, um, each in a different looking VR space. Um, and so as you can see, the different views, um, Racer 1 chooses their room, so they're actually making selections from a carousel of different styles of rooms. Racer 2 is in a different room, they're in the kitchen, and they're, they're able to select from, a, an op, from a, um, a list of different kinds of foods that they would want. Okay, and so in each of the rooms, there would be multiple items in the room. So for instance, in that first room, they can choose the Brady Bunch or Howdy Doody or the 70s show or Mad Men, so on, right? But there's one correct answer. Um, in the initial design construct, all players would have needed to keep track of each round's correct item and at the end answer a challenge question. And so in this construct, You've got the offline players actually keeping track of what each in virtual environment player is seeing and capturing as that correct item. And while it initially sounds like a great game idea, the complexities of having to create five virtual reality environments, um, many different items um, across the themes for each of them, and the unlock function added complexities we weren't sure the technical team would appreciate, so we needed to, to reiterate again. That unlocking feature um, certainly became uh, one of the technical complexities that we decided to forego given the time frame. Hey, Myra, do you mind showing the next uh, version of the, of the uh, doc? We call it, at this point, we're calling it Lost in Time was the name of our game. And that one is yeah, dated so on uh, July 22nd. Yep. Yep. So this is actually our third full spec in three days. So Hen and I were cranking these documents out. Um, so this uh, particular uh, version of the um, spec came about when we met with Aaron, our graphic designer extraordinaire, um, to share our design. And we had volleyed the idea of the five rooms with him. And he was like, you know, guys, that's, you know, he explained to us that uh, it would be a, a it would be kind of complex to have to create all those items and create all those rooms. Um, 
So as he shared his process with us, we decided that we really needed to keep the game to one room that would be reused for the entire game. So this would really help speed up development. Um, and then Aaron also shared with us, um, you know, some items that we needed to, graphic design uh, items that we needed to take into consideration um, and some of the complexity that was involved um, that would further help guide our design to help him hit his development time. For example, things like um, creating a limited number of, um, let's just show you. So creating a limited number of items that would go into the room and deciding how many objects were going to be 3D objects. For example, this is a 3D object, this is 3D, the walls are flat graphics. Um, the wall back here is flat graphics. But the other thing that we had to take into consideration, which was something that we learned also, is that the wallpaper, the popcorn ceiling, um, the wood finished floor, all of those details wasn't just a matter of just slapping it into the graphic design. Those had to be constructed and something as simple as we take for granted, like wallpaper, um, that added a level of complexity. But we really wanted the look to be really 60s, so there was some buy-in for things and a lot of things that we just decided we could do without. Um, right, Ann? Yep, definitely. And so at this point, we started narrowing in on that one room that we would use throughout the game by all five players. Um, and at this point, when you're limited to one space that everyone is going into, you know, you have to get really strategic about the application of your game mechanics um, and choosing, choosing how we were going to craft the experience um, that, that lends to a, a successful game, a successful competition and allows for each person, many of whom had never actually been in a custom VR environment, um, to be able to do some exploration. And so we had a lot of options that we needed to consider uh, that would affect the, the success of this activity. Just a, a couple of things that I think of, um, you know, are all of the items visible to all people when they're in the environment? So for instance, you know, if I've got 25 items in there, that could be confusing and time staking for for our in-environment in players to find the right article um, in, in a way that we're using time as a competitive element, that's an important consideration. Um, next, are all of the items that are in there targetable? Are they all active at all times when they're in the environment, yes or no? So for instance, um, we're gonna see a video in just a few moments that, that shows the experience in the environment you know, for things that weren't going to be targeted, would we want to throw off false positives and lead them down that path, yes or no? Um, and there, are, there certainly are, are um, uh, you know, gaming discussions that could go along with the logic of each of those choices. Very central, uh, again, to the learner experience is how do we engage the offline players in as meaningful a part um, of, the, of the game as the person who's using the cardboard and in the environment at any given time and making sure that as we have one of five in the virtual environment, the other four are, are involved in meaningful learning activity. Um, then we got the general environment design and the aesthetic, right? How many, how many items are we gonna have? What is it going to look like? Um, we wanted it to feel real so that as, as learners are are moving 360 degrees and looking up at the ceiling and looking down at the floor, that it, it felt real. It, it felt um, like they were in an actual space, um, particularly a, you know, a 1960s um, tacky, tacky family room. Um, you know, from another game mechanics perspective, is it gonna be a search the room um, where they are, they're looking through lots and lots of items? Um, that allow, or are we gonna allow um, just a few items there that creates a more simple, more elegant solution that could allow learners to focus just as much on exploring the general space and to see what a virtual environment feels like um, as much as to be able to compete in it. Um, you know, we encourage for leaderboard status, of course, get in there and find your item as quickly as possible, but use the rest of the time in your round to be able to go through and really scrutinize and have a look at what the environment's like. Move forward and backwards so that you can, you can see what it feels like to have that, that full movement in the environment. 
Um, and so this was neat. It provided the opportunity to complete the activity and get a really cool uh, VR experience. So let's go ahead and look at the final design. I know you guys are itching probably to see the actual room and we're getting there. We just wanna be able to show you the process and the steps along the way. All right, so this is the um, final des design document that we created. And um, so going into our process, as Ann mentioned, you know, we had to kind of decide what was our theme gonna be. So we really decided that this would be like planning the perfect party. So we had to narrow down really on what items we would display, but we also had to do some research in order for um, us to find elements that would fit our theme. So because we're narrowing down, we decided that we would use items that were created in 1966 because they all turned, you know, would be items that turned 50 um, uh, in 2016. And so we have them listed here in blue in the design document. Um, and so, yeah, Doritos, created in 1966. Uh, I was not aware of that. So Ann and I both learned something new as we were doing research because we're both 70s babies. So this is way ahead of our time. Um, we also went back and forth on game mechanics um, that we would use for the game uh, because Ann did mention, you know, the scavenger hunt and um, the taboo style for the offline. But we really decided you know, we, this is where we really focus is that it's going to be a scavenger hunt for the um, cardboard wearing player. And then um, for the offline players, it would be the taboo style mechanics. And, you know, if you've ever played taboo, you know that the goal of the taboo game is for you to help your teammate identify words or come up with words without using the actual word or words listed on a card that you're given. So there's a level of complexity there. And, you know, we kind of planned it together. And, and we actually, um, without having the environment created, we went back and forth trying to figure out how that would work, um, you know, by playing some games ourselves and just, you know, bouncing ideas off of each other and, and saying, hey, do you think this would work? Or what if we did it this way? Um, I think that that was really crucial for our, de our design development. Um, so we decided that we would follow the same gameplay um, for Taboo, you know, as Taboo for the offline players um, to create that level of engagement, right, Ann? Yep, definitely. Um, and so, so having the initial design, the offline experience incorporated everything that happened offline was going to be done manually. And think about, you know, as we, we go back to our traditional instructor-led kind of training uh, delivery mode, right? Flip charts and PowerPoint slides um, and things like that. And so we, we planned it so that the virtual reality environment was going to be pretty much the only real technology used. Um, and so using a, for the, for the target secret word, so using the example here, Doritos, right? That's our target that we want them to find. Um, we also needed to display the phrases that they could not say or use, the offline players, as they're giving hints. So we needed a space that, uh, you know, a PowerPoint projected that, you know, you can't say orange, you can't say chip, you can't say triangle, right? So they've got their unmentionables, they've got the target item, and then we've got this timing element, right? So, so the vision was we use PowerPoint for the things the offline players need to see, and then we're manually timing all of this. And so we manually time, determine the winner by each round, and keep that leaderboard like on a flip chart and just flip it with each of the successive rounds. And so it wasn't the most, <laughs> it wasn't the most technically sophisticated design, but you know, it's what we could come up with and it's one that we could reliably deliver based on, you know, pretty much what the facilitator could manage in a classroom delivery environment with 40 participants, eight teams, a lot of yelling, excitement, and competitive spirit in the room. So that was, that was where we were going there. So part online, part offline. The offline, very, very rudimentary. Kayla, what's next for us? Yeah, so we didn't really, we haven't got a lot into the technology side of it, but I imagine there was probably some feedback from um, the tech partners that you were working with on the design. Did you guys align frequently? And, and this is a very short amount of time. 
Um, so yeah, Kayla, so we had a lot of conversations with the design team that we worked with um, right from the beginning um, because that was critical for this to be successful. So by the time we drafted this design document, the entire team was on board. We left nothing to chance. We did not want to go and, and create this, you know, huge design and then meet with the team and have them say, oh, we can't do that or it's unrealistic. So we really worked to ensure that our design uh, was realistic and on target with the objectives that we had um, to create something engaging using um, uh, uh, virtual reality. And as, you know, let's take a look at the, a little bit deeper into the design, design document because it does go into detail. So we had to um, really think about and outline the experience for both the online and offline players. So like, what's to be our environment gonna look like? We had some make game mechanic questions that um, we put on here just because we wanted to get their feedback also because um, Ann and I were trying to decide like, you know, if we time it, is, is there an admin interface that we can use to shut it down? How will we shut that down? How is the speed determined? So we really needed to kind of work some of those ideas through. And so um, we put all that into the, the uh, design document. And we also detailed what the experience would be for online and offline players in the document. So one thing that Ann and I had to do on top of creating this the uh, design documents that we had to write the content for like the wait screen. And you'll see that when we play the video. And the messaging that would appear for the gameplay, we also had to create the taboo cues for each round. And we used Google Docs to do that. And then we just kind of had the graphic designer put it in like a cool little uh, card that we planned on using. We also set the, the rounds to 60 seconds. Um, because we knew that the first time the users put on that cardboard and were immersed into the environment, they would need a few seconds to adjust to the new experience and make sure that they didn't spend the entire time looking up at the ceiling or down at the floor, that they were able to kind of grab their bearings and, you know, be able to walk around the room. Um, and so it's interesting because you see people um, lose kind of, um, a conception of their actual space and once they're in the VR environment with the cardboard and so, you know, you have to guide them a little bit. So what do you think about that, Kayla? Do you have any other questions for us? I, I, I'm fascinated. I think this is so cool and so applicable to so many learning environments. Um, well, actually, can we dive into how the actual final project came together? Yeah, definitely. So I have, and we're going to scroll down a little bit more. Actually, I'm going to switch over. We're going to switch gears. So we're going to show you the actual environment. So it was like we had unleashed the Wonder Twins and they had activated their powers. Um, Kurt and Brad, our developers, really upped their ante and delivered something that we didn't even think about because we didn't think it was even an option given our short development time. Um, so as Brad developed the room environment, Kurt developed the admin interface which provided some additional functions, which were really cool. So I'm going to scrub through this so I can show you. Uh, so the admin panel consists of um, a way for teams to register, right? And so the um, game host or the game administrator can control the game rounds. Uh, there's this large timer that counts down uh, the 60 seconds. Um, there's also um, the taboo style words that show up in the middle of the panel. Let me just scrub this so you can see um, the object along with the unmentionables. Um, there's also uh, this leaderboard, and the leaderboard will um, really track track the um, completion of each round, the time, and whatever team finishes in the in the uh, set amount of time, their time appears, um, and then it does like a total or for all the rounds. And this is something that we originally were going to use flip charts for, and they took our flip chart low-tech solution and really turned it into this fantastic admin panel, which kind of blew my mind. Um, and then they, additionally, they gave us a way um, to reset the entire game, clearing out teams and leaderboards with another admin panel um, that we could just go into and just clear everything out. And we could actually see um, a different set of uh, like information for the game. Uh, so 
I think it was really cool. They really did, you know, go above and beyond uh, for this activity. So any additional questions, Kayla? Yes, I've got so many more to come. Um, and, and the development, and they did such a fabulous job on this. Did you guys do any testing before go live? Definitely. Um, because we use web-based technology, we were, we were really fortunate that, you know, we're going to get into the technologies in just a moment. Um, but the, the decision to use web-based technology, we were able to conduct system functionality tests from all of our various locations. So in Portland, Denver, Washington, D.C., and Milford, Connecticut, we could all be in and experiencing a game, uh, resetting and testing all of the functionality. So while this was originally created for, um, for iOS, we did test on both iOS and Android, um, you know, and we discovered that it worked on both platforms. We just, we knew that learners were going to ask about operable alternates because they were going to want to leave and go and, and show folks what they saw. Um, and so, you know, initially as we knew that we were going to be developing a, a, a virtual reality um, experience using Google Cardboard, we ordered a cardboard the day we started. We jumped into a, a number of different VR um, simplified games. Um, but we were ready to be able to actually get in and, and test and provide feedback. So one of the things, though, in our functional tests that we noticed with this, with this simple VR environment um, is, it, is targeting was a challenge. So for those of you who aren't familiar with cardboard, when you slide your device into the front of it and you close it, on top there's a button. That button is connected to a small piece of cardboard that actually kind of leans close to the screen of the device that's in the cardboard. So when you press that button, it simulates a screen tap. Um, and one of the things that we found in our tests is that even with our target, so on, on the screen that you see here, you can see that our, that our target turns from white to green. When it's on an item that is a clickable target item, it turns green. And so even when it was in the right place, um, targeting functionality didn't, didn't activate correctly every time. They're just the pinpoint precision or the pixel point precision wasn't exactly what we were anticipating. Of course, it's a, you know, an innovation for us that we were working on, and so we knew we were going to learn a lot. Um, and so what, what, our, um, what our developers suggested was making our target items larger, um, larger than scale to make sure that we wouldn't have to worry about that pinpoint accuracy. Um, and, and that did resolve the issue. We also did testing on our rented iPhones to make sure that once we're at the delivery location um, where we're in kind of a high profile environment, everything worked exactly as planned. Um, and to make it easier to administer, of course, we saved the web pages to the home screen of all of the devices. So if something happened and a user got bumped out, it was very easy for them um, to, get, to get back in and get reoriented um, in the game itself. What else, Kayla? Yeah, so once this actually went live with the, um, the learners, I mean, did they actually engage with the solution you created? Oh, they, they were amazed. Um, for a lot of them, it was their very first VR experience. And, and even though it is, is very simple, uh, which was definitely one of the explicit points, um, they loved that it, they, we blended the online cardboard um, VR environment with offline learner experiences. You know, the timing of our rounds in the leaderboard added a competitive element and it pulled all learners into the game. And, you know, to our surprise, the learners expressed a pretty lengthy list of practical applications for this game in their work environments. And one that we thought was, was really interesting was folks were able to observe the rise of the natural leader in a group in a kind of exciting and chaotic situation. That was one of the things that we took away that thought, gosh, that's a, a really neat observation because we saw the same thing. Definitely. Do you have any other questions? I think we we're going to talk technology, right? Yep. So, are there, if you can go into some of the technologies that were used to develop the VR game, I think that would be great for the audience to hear about. All right, great. Let's switch to the PowerPoint. Okay. So, that's Brad Washburn, one of our fantastic developers. Um, so listed here are all of the uh, technologies that were used. Um, so I had actually reached out to the development team, development team and asked them to tell us, like, 
which technologies were used and what were they used for. So this is what they used. Um, they decided to really use an open source web-based platform. Why? Well, because app-based solutions bring added costs and restrictions with them. So, you know, in order to publish an app, you have to, um, you know, to publish it to the uh, Apple App Store, there's like a fee that you have to pay, you have to get developer rights. And so there's that added cost there. Um, for the Play Store, there isn't a fee per se. Um, you can develop freely, but once you get into like commercial publishing, then there's an additional fee. And then they also restrict the way um, that you develop your actual platform. So using an open web-based platform allowed them a lot more flexibility to create a solution that was open and that didn't really need highly specialized equipment to use. That was the other thing, because we were using um, Google Cardboard, and I, if you've ever ordered a Google Cardboard, you know that it um, is it just a box that you purchase and you put it together. And if you've ever priced a VR headset, you know that they can run upwards of $200 so we used the cardboards that were under 20 at the time, and now you can even get the generic versions for under $5, um, and that's just a great option. So I know we're coming close to a close, Kayla. What's your next question? Yeah, I, and before I go to my next question, I just want to throw out there, I'm, um, several people have private messaged me saying that they, they either have recently bought or they plan to buy um, the Google Cardboard viewer. So that is very cool to hear. Um, so yeah, so if you guys can share a little bit, what did you learn having gone through this process of developing mm -hmm. the VR solution? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, you know, we learned a great deal. First of all, just collaborating together made a huge difference. We were able to knock out designs very quickly because we were using Google Docs. We were in there brainstorming together. We were throwing every idea at the project. Um, you know, just having an ID partner, an instructional design partner, a lot of times on projects, you know, practitioners are kind of assigned a project or a task, and we kind of do our work um, solo, and that's the nature of the project. But for, for this project specifically, we were given extensive creative freedom. Doesn't happen on all of our projects, but boy, when we get that creative freedom, knowing what to do with it is really important. So that's kind of a big takeaway is, Collaborate with your peers. When you have the opportunity, do it. Um, you know, we didn't work at all within the technology, but we created designs that were big enough and open enough that our, our developers could look at what we've got and they could marry their technology and what we could do with what we wanted to do instructionally. Um, you know, thinking like a learner and a game designer in this case and batting around lots of ideas and seeing lots of games and coming up with the right constructs. Um, flexibility and communication, this was such a quick project. We communicated via voice one-to-one -one or on a call. There wasn't a lot of flurries of emails of CCs and reply-alls that were unnecessary. Um, and then content is king, you know, it's, it's really tempting with emerging technology to grab onto that, to that um, shiny new thing. And you need to have your content, your audience, um, and the overall aims really clearly defined um, for a project to be successful. Um, so thanks for that. I think, are we ready to go on to uh, to some of our, our best practices? I think we were going to close with that, right? Yep. Yeah, so I was hoping to, you know, maybe hear more. And, and actually, a lot of audience questions have come in, and so we'll we'll try to quickly jump to those here in just a second. But um, what best practices would you guys share with L&D professionals looking to create their first VR solution? All right, Kayla, so let's call them proven practices, because Ann and I really put a lot of hard work into this. And I can tell you that our biggest takeaway is that you don't need to focus on the technology. The technology is only the vehicle for delivery. So think of an ice cream truck driver. He doesn't need to know how to make ice cream. He just needs to create the experience, right, the one that's triggered when you hear that ice cream truck jingle that makes all the kids run outside. So it's kind of a similar approach. And listen here, we have, you know, what our proven practices are. And, you know, Ann mentioned, when you have a partner that you can sign with, that is invaluable. So even if you're working solo, bounce your ideas off of another ID or a friend or a husband and get some feedback. Um, you really want to focus on the experience and the content because the technology isn't as important. Approach it as you would any other instructional design project, right? Because you can create something that's killer, a killer environment, but if 
you know, the mechanics are off and the content is bad, then the experience is kind of ruined. Um, we also want you to begin with a bird's eye view and then focus in on the details. Don't try to do it the reverse way because it's really hard to focus on a detail and blow that out. Um, that's where dry content is really birthed, people. Um, you know, create, share, listen, and evolve. I think that's self-explanatory and, and Anne um, covered that. Don't be married to your design. Be flexible, allow them to, you know, flux. Um, and then this one's a really big one for me. Let your inner child play. Become part of your design. You might be surprised what you can do. Um, when you really start to think like a kid and just, you know, we're not saving lives here. We're not creating, you know, anything that's, you know, is, is life-saving. It's training and have fun with it. Um, and document everything because it allows you to go back, reevaluate what you've worked on, what worked, didn't work, and it allows you to share like Ann and I are doing right now. So I'd say my biggest takeaway for you right now is, you know, I really wish for you to find your creative muse and create an environment of flow for yourself, within yourself. And if you haven't heard of the psychology of flow, Anne's going to drop a, a link in the chat window if she can. Um, if not, we'll share that with you later. Um, but that kind of wraps up our portion of the presentation. I'll pass this back to Kayla. Awesome. Well, thanks, Anne and Myra, for explaining some of the behind-the-scenes details and the instructional design perspective on building a VR project, especially in that very quick time frame. Um, we promised this would be a 45-minute session, so we have a few minutes left for Q&A. Well, we may go a few over if you're able to hang on the line. Um, but just as a reminder, if you have a question for Ann or Myra, um, as well as Tom, I think I saw Tom join in here at some point. I'm going to unmute you, Tom. Hello, hello. Tom, can hello. you hear us? Hello. All right. I can. <laughs> Great. You can mute and unmute yourself um, as you want to chime in. But we have some industry experts on the line if you wanted to ask any questions. And obviously, a lot was covered during this interview and a lot more that we could be discussing. So um, be sure to put those questions in the Q&A module at this time. And we also encourage you to continue the conversation with Ann and Myra beyond today's session. Uh, their contact information is available. There we go. Look at that. Uh, in this slide deck, and we'll be sure to send everybody a link to a follow-up blog post where they'll be addressing some of today's key takeaways and any questions that we are not able to get to. And as a very quick reminder, um, the recording and slides from today will be sent to the email address that you provided when you registered. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to jump into these questions. Uh, there are several that came in. Uh, the first one is, what is the cost considerations for a VR project? So this is Myra. I'll take that. Right. So, yeah, and you can you can interject. Um, I think that some of the major cost considerations is um, around your resources and what kind of equipment you are actually willing to use. Do you want it to be a high-end experience where you're using, like, actual, like, VR um, goggles that are going to cost, like, $200? Um, what type of budget do you have um, to actually create this? Because there's a thousand ways to, you know, slice a ham, and, and with VR, kind of the same thing. There's new technology coming out every day that will allow you to create environments using a lower cost solution. However, it does require specialized skill. So your resources are going to be a huge play in this. And can you add to that? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, and, and for us specifically, we initially priced out, uh, you know, looking at different technologies and solutions. We decided we wanted to go with in-house talent to be able to put this together because we knew um, that, that using in-house talent was going to be able to control cost. It was, again, kind of that innovation kitchen type of project and approach. Um, you know, but, but certainly getting developer kits and, and costs associated with that was, was something that we really didn't have to deal with because we used in-house talent. I would also add that, that, you know, some of the considerations have in the past uh, been the availability of the uh, equipment that's capable of displaying uh, this type of environment without lag. Uh, the fact that so many people have computing devices in their pockets in the form of smartphones uh, makes this technology more attainable. So I would say uh, being focused on the right platform to deliver uh, your technology and keeping that in mind um, is, is probably a, a good thing to keep in mind. Great. Thanks, Tom. So I want to jump to the next question um, that came in from the audience. Uh, how much time, and, I, and, and this came back 
I thought about this one too, because you guys are so busy working on um, different client projects. How much time did both of you spend designing the solution? Mm, so, that's a um, great question. Yeah. So, and I know that um, I try to keep a timetable of everything, and I can tell you that Ann and I banged out those design documents in under an hour. Um, but it did require us to, to kind of just have that be our one focus. We scheduled a one-hour meeting, and that's all we focused on. We, we eliminated all distractions. Um, we got on Google Docs, and we just got on the phone and started just falling back and forth. Um, so I would, and do you, I mean, what do you estimate we kind of did? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you know, for, for the initial brainstorming sessions, it was a couple of hours. To get to a flushed out detailed design document with meetings with the team, it was probably, probably 20 hours a piece, and then there was time writing instructional content that went with that and, of course, testing. You know, so you're talking about, you know, a few, probably a few dozen hours um, across the two of us to be able to get to the design. Now, that is separate from the development resources to build the, the environment, the graphic design time. Tom, do you happen to have any of that information? We had about, um, between pulling, you know, in an engineer and a developer and an artist, we had about two and a half resource uh, man hours um, dedicated for about four weeks. Okay. Okay. Great. Hope that answers the question. If not, submit another, another one and we can address it in the Q&A email that we'll send out the blog. Perfect. Yes, and we're coming up on about two minutes before I'm, I'm going to um, cut this one off. There's so many questions coming in. I'm going to jump to this one because it's actually come up from a few different individuals in different ways. But essentially, um, you know, what types of learning environments do you actually think virtual reality is a good fit? Mm, this is Anne. I'll take the lead on that one. Um, you know, really, when, when you're looking at a, a VR solution, given the cost, um, given the development cost, the equipment cost, the maintenance cost, Typically, it's going to be things that are um, very, very risky, for example, um, experiencing an environment that, that is, is not safe, so something safety-related, um, something that has significant OSHA implications, like um, doing work, say, on, on a piece of telecom equipment that is, that is up in the air significantly, um, something that is um, impossible to replicate. For instance, I. I was talking with a colleague who developed an interactive VR experience for a meat packing plant. They had huge problems with turnover because people simply, they would nod their heads and say they get what goes on there, but until they put on the VR and they could see what's happening in their work environment, what the floor is like, they had scent pods, they could smell what it smells like, they were able to drop their attrition by nearly 30% in the first year that they brought that, that virtual reality experience to folks coming into the job, the, the, um, into their environment as an employee. So risky, dangerous, impossible, or something that's, that's high stakes because the environment simply can't be, be replicated um, in a way that people on the outside could experience it. I hope I addressed that all right. I think you did. I, I, I do. And, I, and I'm going to take one more question. There are a lot coming in. What I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the chat and the Q&A open for just a minute or two after we drop off the call. Um, so if you have a question, go ahead and still input it here. What we're going to do is Anne and Myra are going to be addressing um, any of the Q&A that came in that we did not get to on the live call in the blog post. We'll be emailing that to everybody uh, along with the recording and the slide deck. So. Um, you know, this one actually is is more of a, um, a statement than anything, and, and Myra kind of goes to you because you kind of have the technology focus on here. I know, like in in the um, proven, I'm trying not to say best practices, in the proven practices that you shared, um, you know, you talked about how t technology wasn't the main focus, or that you didn't necessarily have to be technology savvy. I know personally that you you are very technology savvy. Uh, what are some advice that you give to folks on the line who maybe don't have the technology capabilities or the savviness um, to move forward with this or any advice to get them to be successful at putting something like this together? Yeah, definitely. So um, I would definitely say, you know, if you aren't comfortable with the technology piece, 
um, and aren't comfortable doing the research on it or have a hard time kind of understanding because there's a lot of moving pieces is really partner with um, your developers. Um, most organizations have an IT department, and in that IT department, there's usually someone who is a gamer, a hacker, or, you know, has some kind of programming knowledge. And, you know, because it's such a cool emerging technology, there are people out there that aren't in the L&D space that can really provide you some good, um, you know, information. I say join a LinkedIn group um, for virtual reality topics. Um, on Twitter, there's groups that focus on virtual reality topics and really ask those questions out there and, and you know, don't, don't be intimidated by it. Um, address, you know, approach it as an instructional design piece and just think of the, the VR as the vehicle that's just going to drive it for you. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I am going to wrap it up just due to time. I, um, you know, I want to say thank you again to our speakers today, uh, Ann Rollins and Myra Roldan. And thanks to everyone who attended for your time and attention. If you enjoyed what they shared today, I just want to let you know that Ann and Myra will both be featured speakers at the eLearning Guild's upcoming conference, uh, Reality 360 in San Jose, California. And I believe that's this July. Um, we also hope that you'll join us again for our next webinar. This will be with Jim Patton. He's fabulous uh, to work with. I'm excited to do a session with him, and he's going to be discussing don't sell to your customers, listen to them. And so I want to thank everyone again for your time, and I wish everyone a great rest of your day or evening. Thanks, Kayla. Thanks, Kayla. Thanks, thank everybody, you. for joining. Yeah, thanks, everyone, for joining.